Ja, meine sehr geehrten Damen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard the basis and laid the foundation for whatever will happen to the economy in Europe and what will be the consequences. Now, I was asked to talk about the political level, i.e. the freedom model of Europe, and therefore I was asked to give a few ideas in this respect. In spring 2019, the European Commission published a strategy paper about the future of the European-Chinese relationships, that is, the relationships which we've just discussed discussed from a different perspective, of course. Now, this paper is a shift in paradigms in the geopolitical orientation of the European Union. The People's Republic of China is uh, considered by the Commission, is not considered only as an economic competitor, but also, for the first time, as a systemic rival, which... Uh, promotes alternative governance models. China, so uh, the Commission says, threatens its investment, and by do, uh, with its investment, China threatens the socio-economic and financial sustainability as well as the rule of law and good governance in Africa, in non-EU Europe, but increasingly also in member states of the European Union. Now, how did we reach this point? Two decades of uh, the accession of China to the World Trade Organization, many, you know, forecasts about an uh, unchangeable, uh, you know, axis of the People's Republic or export or approach of the People's Republic of, Ch uh, of China to the Western model of liberal democracy have not come true. True, Francis Fukuyama. Uh, said this is the end of history and this has not happened. You know, we are in a hegemony of liberalism and democracy and where are the Europeans? Where are the Europeans at the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century in this system conflict? You know, different or in contrast to the Cold War, this uh, or today's system competition from a Europe perspective is not a conflict about military dominance or domination. No, it is all about uh, economic prosperity, wealth, global technology, leadership and the success. The success when it comes to handling, managing social challenges as well as natural threats. The success measure of this global system conflict is what uh, political scientists call output legitimation, legitimation, meaning which system uh, keeps its prosperity promise better, which system is in a better and more effective position to handle the big or face the big challenges of uh, the present. And politics is then measured under the conditions of specific results and, of course, in a global framework. And, of course, the system of liberal democracy is under pressure to prove itself and, therefore, it cannot get away from this kind of competition. And, you know, China is aspiring to running and doing this competition for decades and pursues a long-term plan can clearly be seen in Africa, also in this initiative of the new Silk Road. Sigmund Gabriel, in 2018, at the Munich Security Conference, pointed it out very clearly. And I quote, this initiative for a new Silk Road is not what many believe to be it to be a sentimental memory of Marco Polo. No, it stands for the attempt to establish a comprehensive system to influence the world in the Chinese in, in, in the Chinese interest, and this is no longer about economy or economics only. No, China is developing a comprehensive system alternative, an alternative to the Western system which is not based on our model of freedom, democracy and individual human rights. And this, to some extent, is new to us. For more than 300 years, the Western world determined what the development of the world is, is or will be. First colonization, then globalization, all global sites, locations, all institutions, all organizations, the international law system, human rights, they are all influenced and have come from, Western, from the Western side. But this time is over.
Growth rates of uh, annually 8% make sure that China and other parts of the world are catching up. Demographics will also play a role. You know, in the beginning of the 20th century, Europeans accounted for 20% of the world population. Today, 7%. And in 2050, only 5%. And at the same time, the African continent is growing every week by one million people. And in 2050, the population in Africa will have doubled. And also in economic terms, the future frequently happens somewhere else. Europe has got only a share of 25% in the global gross domestic product. 90% of the worldwide growth is generated outside Europe. And in the digital economy, Europe really completely lost out. The world has been clearly divided. We looked at one part, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon and West in the West, Samsung, Huawei, Tencent and Alibaba in the East. There's just one, if I'm informed, uh, there's just one European platform invented in the Netherlands, Bukina.com. Well, it's been bought by the Americans. Now, the European Union still is one of the biggest economic spaces of the world and still has got political weight. But our values of individual freedom, rule of law and democracy are still attractive. But our model is no longer uncontested. You know, there are many, uh, say, emerging powers. We s neglect some of them, but nevertheless, they are, s they are there. And they, of course, uh, try to grow. And surely China is challenging the West uh, when looking at uh, this aspect of prosperity when listening to Mr. Fust, although I'm not sure whether, this, whether they will be successful in this respect. Handling and managing the COVID-19 pandemic with its successes, with its failures, is another chapter in this system conflicts which must be considered. Now, what are the repercussions on our self-image, our self-image as a liberal and democratic society? You know, if uh, public life in a Chinese one-party state returns to, no to normality faster than in Europe. Federal President Frank-Walter Steinmeier, uh, you know, summed up uh, this feeling of insecurity in March of this year. I quote, Growth declines can be balanced out. Injuries to our self-image heal less well. The idea that an authoritarian single-party state is superior to us in terms of government and governance is a challenge for us, particularly for our self-understanding. And in particular, it questions a popular attitude in Europe that the political action in the West is the only system which sets standards in the world. And, you know, many in Africa do not believe this anymore. Now, what are the resources which can be used in order to face uh, uh, the challenges of a rapidly changing world? You know, for liberal societies, a system conflict with author authoritarian states like China uh, are a special challenge because societal resources are not simply part and parcel of what uh, the state authority can handle. You know, the self-constraints of democratic systems will reduce necessary necessarily reduce its ability to act. Totalitarian states uh, are much less subject to questions of weighing pros and cons. Yet in a global system competition, systems like the Chinese single-party state will still have uh, you know, an advantage uh, of uh, having larger state action radii, uh, the possibility of detaching or disengaging from legally defined processes and have, um, you know, much less, say, restricted possibilities of controlling or enforcing things. Now, against this backdrop, and against the backdrop of these, you know, challenges, many ask the question, what cause 
is a joint Europe to embark on in the 21st century. Do we need more sovereignty of member states? Should we focus on individual freedom rights? Shall we rethink them and demand more executive power? Occasionally, at least in Germany, I was under the impression that Uh, if the wish for a more restrictive uh, approach would be voiced, then this, you know, uh, looked like it. You know, is the EU too sluggish to be able to act? And I uh, am in favor of two basic fundamental, say, directions. One, we in Europe have to uh, be sure or reassure ourselves. Now, what does it mean? It means we have to redefine the reason for the European Union in the 21st century. And to do so, this is then the, the second point, we have to embark on a, on a course of reform, which will increase the ability of Europe to act without, you know, neglecting our basic values like rule of law, democracy and individual freedom. You know, when the European Coal and Steel Community was founded in 1952 by Schubert and Monet, then, you know, the leading promise of the European integration was peace, freedom and joint prosperity. These values are still correct and important, and we shouldn't consider them, them to be a matter of fact. But for a generation for whom war in Europe, and uh, fortunately enough so, seems to be unthinkable, peace is a very abstractive va value. And therefore the narrative, the history, the story of the European integration has to be reinvented by introducing a paradigm shift that is from internal orientation to world or outside orientation. We founded the European Union to protect it, uh, to protect ourselves against each other, but now we have to establish it as a means of protecting ourselves against others. So it is not only about a federal order, it's not only about the constitutional finality, this is something which we're going to fight over right now at present. No, it is about the question what we, the Europeans, need the European Union in the 21st century above all. We need it in order to hold our ground, to hold our field in a world of unilaterally acting superpowers which no European country can compete with, you know, unless we act together in a European association. And we need it in order to face the challenges of the present, like climate change, migration crisis, digitalization, and joint security, and to be able to give an effective response to all this. And we need it in order to defend a life model and all the values like freedom and democracy in the global system conflict. This is a real, say, litmus test or performance test. And I'm firmly convinced that the European Union is the only realistic, uh, say, entity which is able to respond to these challenges and will find an answer to these challenges. Either we as Europeans will manage to bring this about together or not at all. But, uh, you know, this is sometimes more difficult than we thought. Uh, and, you know, we have to do so r staying together on the inside but become say, able to act together towards the outside world, this is certainly not easy. And, you know, we will be able as a kind of, say, supranational government model to withstand any tests, uh, you know, jeopardizing, threatening freedom and democracy. Whenever we fall behind in one of these crucial issues, if we focus on divisive things too much in Brussels, then all this will not work work, you know, different from a national state, uh, the, the, the EU um, is not an end in itself, but it is subject to renegotiation. It has to prove itself time and again.
the instrument which, uh, according to my conviction, is necessary in order to defend the European freedom model, the instrument which we need will be measured, you know, in terms of costs and benefit and weighing uh, the respective pros and cons is not necessarily rationally done like the Brexit, but it is a reality and we have to face this reality. If the European Union is to guarantee our European model of freedom, then we have to convince people again. It has to focus on what is substantial and essential. In all fields in which we've been cooperating on a European level, in which we have created a specific and visible added value, then we should transfer competencies to the European Union. And this, of course, refers to topics of trading. And, you know, uh, the panel, the question was raised, what will happen if Chinese and the United States and the Americans demand something different from the Europeans? You know, you should be with us and not trading with the others. And I can say that this picture is must be more pessimistic, you know, when looking at the inside because we will no longer manage to conclude a trade agreement. TTIP, dead. CETA, well, with a trick, well, it's uh, come into effect, but we are far away from having a majority in the European Parliament for the trade agreement, and it's been negotiated for 20 years with the respective states. It's the most progressive uh, trade agreement with sustainability. All the issues, we could set standards, we could make our influence felt in terms of climate, pr uh, climate control, climate protection and consumer protection. You know, the coalition here in Austria, for instance, um, I think uh, in today's form, there will not be agreement, and the Austrian Parliament also issued a few resolutions against it. Maybe New Zealand, Australia, maybe here we will be successful, but, uh, you know, if uh, we have states where are authoritarian rulers, like in Brazil, and, you know, it is not possible to conclude such agreements. Uh, and in a CO2 uh, footprint, of course, this also plays a role. Agriculture and the power, you know, all this is has to be taken into account. It, we find it more and more difficult to convince people that there are smaller, say, disadvantages in Europe, but people do not see the overall pictures, you know, investment protection inside, outside. You know, if uh, people invest here, then we do no longer have, uh, you know, a control over it, uh, but the respective member states and the Chinese too really understand this. Now, cooperate and cooperation, this is what we have to do when it comes to security and military. And, and, and armed forces, you know, we will not have a European arming overnight, you might say. You know, the Portuguese, for instance, for 300 years, they are connected, say, or linked or tied to the UK because of respective uh, contracts. But, you know, we might start at least to, you know, procure things together, 120 weapon system, the Americans have got 20, surely we are not efficient, of course not. Energy union. But Germany is just uh, not taking part, and there are other states who dislike this, uh, you know, Poland, Hungary, because, you know, people are not talking to each other any longer. Digitalization, research, innovation. Internal market, uh, digital to bin internal market doesn't exist at all. And also stabilization of the common currency. And, you know, we've seen what happens if we do not have a common monetary system. We have got no control. We are just doing what the Americans are telling us because we do not manage to become stronger together. And, of course, there are other differences, for instance, when it comes to health and social policies, and surely here communitarization will lead to a split at the end of the day. And surely there are other areas where we exaggerated things, and this includes, you know, the um, state subsidy, subsidies law or state aid law, and you might say lots of things have been wasted, uh, which we could have invested somewhere else, and last year we've seen things in in, in, in the context of the tax law. And maybe the important point, we have to be better, become better in areas 
where we are really superior to other systems. And this is the free competition of opinions. The democratic process may take longer than, you know, decision-making process in an autocratic country. But at the end of the day, our competition, and like you, Mrs. Schnitzer said, this will lead to higher efficiencies because wrong decisions are being made um, uh, visible and can be corrected because we permit open criticism and therefore our institutions are more stable in the long run because the governments control, therefore they are held responsible otherwise they are voted out and this is the competitive edge which our freedom or political political model has and uh, others do not have it. But at this point, I must say, when talking about the central competitive edge of the European or rather the, the say, Western model, there is surely some kind of backlog demand, some pent-up demand, i.e. we have to communicate political decisions. You know, in a democracy, this is certainly part and parcel of uh, everyday political lives and, you know, these decisions must be published. And this is not happening in Europe. So so we've got a, a lack of a European public, uh, we've got a highly fragmented political debate in 27, you know, partial publics, language barriers, and of course other organizations, the way the European Parliament's action at the plenary meeting doesn't deserve this term uh, discussion. There are one minute statements presented in the respective native lang language, and then the debate, you know, is uh, not perceived as an, as an exchange of opinions, and this means there is lacking a central element of uh, democracy. On a European level, political decisions are taken in a kind of unpolitical space. Nobody explains these decisions, and, you know, over the last few years, this really led to dwindling away of uh, the acceptance of the European Union. Another problem, the responsibility fusion which happens on a European level, you know, when it comes to, to procuring these vaccines, hardly anyone knows who is responsible or in charge of what. So, and then it is really, really very easy to be cross with the European Union, be angry at it. You know, it's the responsiveness, you know, this is what uh, is termed the different facets of something. You know, people voting, you know, they think no use because nothing will change. We had a big coalition in the past, now we have an even bigger coalition. Nothing really will happen. So the member state uh, governments, you know, nominate uh, people to this or that position, you know, this uh, is to gain influence. But the central element of a democracy, you know, go to vote and vote out a government, vote in and out of government, this is what creates democracy. This is missing on a European level. And there are other issues which I can mention, you know, it is so difficult to change the European law, the initiative law or right of the parliament plays a role, but most people do not really, say, perceive these deficits or shortcomings. But, you know, expectations to be met by the European Union have not been met, have not been fulfilled, you know. And, you know, by way of conclusion, the European Union um, defending freedom, democracy, plays and is supposed to play a serving role. And in order to do so, we really need a genuine competition of opinions on a European level, a public which is discussing this, focusing on issues which will promote and make visible this kind of progress and cooperation. Even then, it will be difficult because this value added is not the same for everyone. Joint European interests are not necessarily the sum total of the interests of the member states, and this refers to social differences as well.
and questions or issues which arise. You know, not everyone is thinking about everything in the same way. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, the next few years are a very critical phase when certain courses, so to speak, are set for the Europe for Europe and European member states. You know, compared to the Schumann era, we can say it's about the shift of her paradigms from the internal perception to or orientation to the external and outside orientation. That is, we have to get out of uh, the internal perspective and become, say, a kind of um, global player. So our Western liberal freedom model should have the competitive edge. Since uh, the conference for the future of Europe, I consider it to be a chance for opportunity in order to develop, design um, a strong union and also show the advantages, the competitive edges of our values so that they will be accepted and prove at the end of the day that it is the more stable uh, system and that all this will be, say, anchored in the minds of people. If this will happen, and I'm convinced, then this European model will defend its position, position uh, within the struggle of systems in this world. Thank you very much.